All this gold can only mean one thing, it's award season. Let's face it, 2021 was not a good year. It's okay, you don't have to keep lying to yourself. Come on, say it with me now. The year of our Lord and Savior 2020 was better. What could anybody possibly hate about 2020? Besides the whole global pandemic, nationwide panic, and societal and economic collapse that our country has faced, 2020 had some pretty good games. Just saying. And what does 2021 have? We still got all those issues, but now with less good games. Like, was this year even worth it? Welcome to the sixth annual Tyler's Probably Biased Bestest Things of Best Things 2021 Omicron Edition, now bought out by China. Thank you, Chinese government, for paying me to say video games are pretty dang good. I have joined the likes of Grasshopper Manufacturer, Turtle Rock Studios, and Toshihiro Nagoshi famous game director of the Yakuza series as property of China. Congrats to myself for the newfound wealth. How else you think I can afford this suit? And now I will burn this PNG of Winnie the Pooh as my inauguration. This year's list was much harder for me to build than last year's. There just weren't as many standout hits this year like previous ones. All this year did was give me further disdain for AAA game corporations. And I thought I had already reached max disdain. Look at what you've done, 2021. You've given me more Dane to diss. Ubisoft is garbage. Activision is garbage. And none of that's new, that's always been there, but now it's just way more obvious and nothing's being done about it. The only reason customers are actually fighting back this time is because this year's Call of Duty and Far Cry suck. It's easy to vote with your wallet when you already don't like the games they are releasing. All Ubisoft has to do is release another semi-decent Assassin's Creed game and everyone will forget they always do. Look at Riot Games. They've been garbage for a long time too, but people ignore it because they like the Arcane and the League of Legends. Ugh, maybe there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. What if we did communism? Hit him with the top 10. Number 10, Emily is away three, or heart. The, the three is the heart. It's made, the heart's made out of a three, so that's how they get around doing the Emily's Away 3. It's really clever, actually. The next installment in one of gaming's greatest franchises has finally arrived. And I bet nobody watching this video has ever even heard of it. Emily is Away 3, like each game in the series before it, is about talking to women. The greatest challenge for any gamer, am I right? It's a dating sim crossed with nostalgia, since it's a period piece set in the old-timey times of the internet, 2008. Toying with the game's coy recreation of Facebook from 2008, helps transport the player to simpler times of talking with friends all night long on some crappy social media. Something we totally don't still do now. The nostalgia trip of Facebook circa 2008 might not carry the same weight that AOL Instant Messenger did for me in Emily is Away 1, which is free on Steam for everyone, just saying. But Face Nook still produces some fun memories and even more cringy. <laughs> the storytelling and dialogue feels right at home for anybody who has ever lost countless hours chatting with friends online, culminating in the most fleshed out Emily is Away game yet. Go check it out. Or, uh, come on, at least the first one, it's free. A new challenger has appeared, Hunt Showdown. Oh no, a video game that didn't come out in 2021, how could this be? Well that's because I probably put more hours into that game than any other game this year. Plus it's been releasing new content all year. Hunt Showdown is the first Battle Royale style game that's ever really kept its hooks in me. Despite its popularity, I never cared much for the genre. But the smaller scale, specified setting, and specialization towards stealth help create a much more tense and intimate gameplay experience than any other Battle Royale game. Number nine, Knockout City. 2021 may not be the best year for gaming, but it definitely allowed a lot of great multiplayer games to bubble up towards the surface. Knockout City is definitely one of those titles. What is it? It's quite simple. It's dodgeball. You'd think we would have had an excellent dodgeball game by now, but I guess everybody was too busy copying Call of Duty or making battle royales that copy Call of Duty. So Knockout City copies Splatoon instead. Only stylistically, of course. The game plays nothing like you've ever played before. Knockout City captures the raw thrills of real dodgeball with its own spin on the game. No, you aren't split up on two sides. Instead, you're running around a map 
grabbing dodgeballs that you find throughout, and chucking them at enemies. Simple enough, right? The game reveals its depth through the mind games that come from having curb throws, or lob throws, or different throw speeds, pump fakes, tackles, catching balls and volleying them back and forth, special balls like bombs or cages, or what about two different jump buttons? This all adds up to create incredibly frantic firefights where the tides can turn at any moment. This game deserves more eyes on it. Just don't stare too long because the art style is kind of gross. Number 8. Back for Blood. A friend of mine told me, if you love Left 4 Dead, you'll hate Back for Blood. But if you like Left 4 Dead, you'll love Back 4 Blood. And that statement could not be more true. Make no mistake, Back 4 Blood is hearkening back to Left 4 Dead. But it is way more than just another Left 4 Dead. Its intricate card system has you unlocking perks tailored to specific playstyles. Which means the game has a much heavier reliance on playing your role compared to Left 4 Dead's more arcade-like pick up and play nature. Building decks and stacking cards together is half the fun of the game because it grants the player freedom to create their own class and play the way they want to. This makes every playthrough different, allowing experimentation with the systems at play, like the AI director placing cards against you for every run. This means no two runs are ever the same. Layer this on top of magnificent teamwork-based level design that you don't see much today, and you got yourself one of the best co-op experiences of the year. Wait a minute. Create their own class? This game is just copying Call of Duty. A new challenger has appeared. Cyberpunk 2077. I know, haha, Cyberpunk 2077. Everybody's favorite punching bag of 2020. It's so broken, why would it ever make a game of the year list? Well, this isn't a joke. I didn't play this game until early this year, and despite everything else that came out, this game still stuck with me. And no, it's not because of that naked T-posing bug. The tantalizing characters and onion-layered writing still shines brilliantly, blinding my eyes from the numerous bugs and crashes I experienced in January. It's still a great game, and still hard for me to recommend, but as time has moved on, it's gotten easier with each patch. It's in a much more stable state than it ever was at launch. And unlike the GTA Definitive Edition, I actually trust CD Projekt Red to fix this game as best as possible. Don't let the controversy push you away from one of the top 10 gaming experiences I had in 2021. And that's saying a lot when I kept seeing this more times than any gaming person should ever see this. Number 7. Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl Honestly, I didn't even have to play this game to tell you that it's worthy of Game of the Year discussion. What if Smash Bros, but Nickelodeon characters? Like, come on, that's already an S-tier idea. Oh? But the gameplay is actually on par with most competitive fighting games? What? The roster has the deep cuts you actually want to see? And Loud House, but shut up, Danny Phantom is fighting Ren and Stimpy, okay? This is wild! Like the Thornberry who's also in this. It has rollback netcode? I don't even know what that is, but everybody in the fighting game community loves those words. If the single player content was more feature rich, this would easily be number one. But for right now, I'm just happy it came out as good as it is. Number six, Resident Evil Village. Earlier in the year, I would have swore this was gonna be number one. It's a Resident Evil game that loves Resident Evil 4 so much that it hurts its poor little soul. But that's a good thing. Capcom produces another solid entry in the franchise by borrowing the best bits from its predecessors. Also by adding some gothic aesthetics that feel right at home with Resident Evil's campy nature. It's even one of the better paced Resident Evil games. Well, besides the part where it turns into some Call of Duty action nonsense. But the level variety ultimately works in its favor. How many times do we have to keep teaching you this lesson, old man? Stop copying Call of Duty. Number five, Halo Infinite. Thanks to Halo 4 and 5, there was a short period of time where I thought I just outgrew Halo. But 343 finally did it. They finally made a Halo game worthy of its prestigious name. Infinite is the best Halo game since Reach by a landslide. It takes all the best parts from 5. And yes, Halo 5 does have some good stuff in it. Refining those little bits and injecting them with elements from Halo 3 
the best Halo. To create kinetic first-person shooter gameplay, that's hard to come by these days unless your full legal name is Doom Guy. Infinite evolves the combat that Bungie fostered for modern-day FPS sensibilities. In short, the shooting is sublime. So subliminal that it washes away all the numerous nitpicks that are scattered across the windshield. Battle pass progression sucks? Who cares? It's so much fun to play. Stuck playing oddball for the thousandth time when all you want to play is Slayer? So what? The guns shoot good. Open world design in the campaign doesn't impress because of its cookie cutter open world structure that you've seen so many times in other AAA video games that you're just tired of it now and it makes you long for the days when Bungie would make methodical level design that was unmatched. Um, who cares? It's Halo with a grappling hook now. 11 out of 5. Number 4. Guardians of the Galaxy. I think it's safe to say, James Gunn's version of the Guardians has supplanted itself as the penultimate version of these characters. So much so that when he was fired from Guardians 3, nobody even dared to try and replace him. So seeing anybody else, even from another art form, take a crack at these characters always felt like less than James Gunn to me. But this game proved to me that there are writers out there capable of tackling these characters with the same amount of love that James Gunn has for them. Guardians of the Galaxy is a triple A ass, triple A video game that is ripped straight from the PS3 and 360 console generation. But in a good way. Guardians is grabbing from the good parts of a linear narrative focused action adventure game akin to Uncharted 2 or 3. Plus the writing on display is smarter than you'd expect. Taking the Guardians we've all come to love and tweaking them in their own clever ways without trying too hard to deviate from what the MCU has shown can work. This game nails the character dynamics so well, and surprises you with its hard-hitting emotional beats. Number 3. Psychonauts 2 Playing through Psychonauts 1 for the first time this year was an absolutely delightful surprise. And its sequel more than delivers, like any good sequel should. It's more of the creative level design and witty writing of Psychonauts 1 with even more psychic powers, improved gameplay, and a huge graphical leap forward. With public opinion on mental health becoming much more positive since the first game's release, Psychonauts 2 feels right at home in 2021. Tackling these subjects not only through its writing, but through its gameplay mechanics and level design. It's a story that only works in video game form in the sense that it is using the unique language of video games and interactivity to portray its themes to the player. All this praise, and it's also one of the funniest games I've played all year, which is quite the achievement considering how hard it is for video games to nail comedy. You owe it to yourself to become a Psychonauts fan. I mean, what else are you gonna do, play? A new challenger has appeared, Yakuza Like a Dragon. Every Yakuza game deserves a spot in the Game of the Year discussion but no other one deserves it more than Yakuza Like a Dragon. Every Yakuza game balances drastic tonal shifts from heart-pounding crime drama to wacky Saturday morning cartoon hijinks better than the last. Yakuza Like a Dragon ditches its usual beat-em-up gameplay to introduce a more traditional JRPG battle system. It also deviates from its titular cast of characters to a whole new ensemble to follow. Leaving the beloved Dragon of Dojima behind may sound disappointing, but Ichiban is an infinitely charming main character that excites me for the future of the franchise. With him by your side, you'll be laughing one moment, then crying the next, and then crying again out of laughter. Regardless, you're always gonna have a smile on your face playing this game. Everybody needs to play at least one Yakuza game in their lifetime, and Like a Dragon is a great place to start. Now it officially came out last year, but only on like Xbox and PC and PS4. This year, Like a Dragon came out on PS5 and that's where I played it. So yeah, uh, it totally deserves a spot on this list. Number two, The Artful Escape. Now this game may not be for everybody, but it's definitely the kind of game for me. It's more of a walking simulator than anything else, but with so much style and confidence in what it's going for, that it stands out and makes a name for itself. Which is good for them, because that's essentially what the game is all about. It's a meditative story about a young musician who is introduced to a cosmic journey of self-discovery, to escape from underneath the daunting shadow of his now deceased famous folk singer uncle. Everything you do, from how you shred your guitar to choosing your backstory and outfit, is all in service of the overarching theme. Folk music sucks. 
I mean, be true to yourself. A short and sweet story of soul searching, wrapped tight with mesmerizing art direction, <clears throat> snubbed at the Game Awards. <clears throat> Ooh, sorry, I need some water. Rich characters and top notch performances. Also, it doesn't copy Call of Duty. What's not to love? A new challenger has appeared. Disco Elysium. This game is a modern classic. From what it accomplishes in branching narrative and player choice, to what it has to say about identity, political views, and the philosophical world around us, Disco Elysium excels in everything it's going for. It even finds fascinating ways to tie in its diverse gameplay mechanics into the themes while also being an RPG that actually sticks its landing in the end, rather than tapering off in quality by the time you hit credits. I really can't sing its praises enough. And yeah, this game technically came out in 2019, but the final cut came out this year, and it's the first time on consoles, so I think it deserves a spot. Plus, the final cut added voice acting to this game, which adds so much nuance to the writing, it's crazy to think that people actually played this game without hearing Kuno's voice. Kuno doesn't buy that shit! Number 1. No More Heroes 3 no More Heroes 3 is the kind of game that instills my hope in video games. At times, it feels like the anti-video game, reminding me why I seek out art in the first place. I want to see something audacious, something experimental, something with a unique voice. Take risks, push boundaries, do whatever you want. No More Heroes 3 might not be a polished masterpiece, but it's the rough edges that give the game charm. I'd rather experience something like this than the 30 millionth enemy outpost in Far Cry 6. Its unpredictability is refreshing in a gaming ecosystem that relies on repetitive gameplay loops and boilerplate story structures. Thank you Travis Touchdown and Suda51 for reminding me that video games can be freaking weird like me. Oh, come on.